Hello friends, I'm the Reverend Terry Peterson, Minister of St. John's in Gurich. Today is Thursday, the 17th of February, 2022. Um, it's five o'clock, so it's time for a bit of wine in the word, pink wine today, because sometimes you just need a little pink wine, don't you think? Um, whatever you are doing to mark the transition from one part of the day to the next, I hope you will just take a moment to um, take a deep breath and move intentionally from daytime toward evening and that we mark that time together with some community building and some gathering around God's word. We always begin by sharing a bit of our day. The high and low points are an easy way to start. So I will tell you this is such a small thing and yet such a marker of where we are in the year. Um, Today is the day I noticed that I need to adjust the time when my outside lights come on because it's come on just now, but it's still light outside. So that's an amazing point in the day when it's not dark so early that I need to have outside lights on before five o'clock. So I get to change the light a little bit and just after this I'll do that. Um, and put it to come on a little bit later. So that's amazing. I love this time of year when it's starting to get lighter and lighter and I will love it even more when we're in full on summer and it's light until ages into the night. Um, the low point of my day I think is just a sort of general thing that many of us are experiencing but right now I feel a little bit like you know when you're like playing bingo or something and you're waiting a really long time for one number and it just feels like your card is filling up but you can't get that one number, um, except in a bad way because <laughs> I don't want the number. It feels like basically everyone around me has COVID and somehow I'm the one who doesn't touch wood. Um, and it's like everyone on the card is just filling up and somehow my number hasn't been called and I'm grateful for that. I don't want to have COVID, which is why I'm touching every wood thing around me. But um, it's a little bit unnerving to see, to just see it sort of popping up in, in my circles and not hopefully coming into the manse. So trying to be extra vigilant and careful and um, protect myself and the other people that I come into contact with each week, which is a fair number. Um, so yeah, it's stressful and exciting in, in a not good way. <laughs> um, and of course, I worry about all of those people around me who have it right now. Some of them have symptoms and some don't. And they worry about if they accidentally exposed anyone um, before they knew and all of that, like all that stress is just adding on to the difficult times that we live in. So I see that for my friends and colleagues and church people and neighbors and um, yeah, I see that. I hope that everyone stays well or gets well and that we somehow manage to do what we need to do as a human society globally to bring this um, to a close so that it is not dangerous for so many people. So whatever your own high and low points might be, I hope you will share them with someone. Feel free to pop them in the comments or send me a message or to talk to the people you live with or your neighbors, phone a friend, phone someone else from the church that you haven't seen in a while and just have a chat about what your life is like. All those, even the little things like the light, all those things that make up our lives, also when we share them, help us build up the strength of the body of Christ. So. We need that strength, so please do take this opportunity to just reach out and build up those bonds, those connections. Today, I thought we would do what I would have said in a sermon extra um, about the second half of the text from this past Sunday, which will again set us up for this coming Sunday because we are reading at this moment um, almost straight through John. Like we are going to skip a little bit that I'll mention, but not very much and certainly no action, just a lot of repetitive talking, which John is very good at. And the people in the Bible study have realized that um, a lot of the Old Testament is really good at as well. <laughs> Last night we were discussing 
portion of the book of Exodus where it's word for word the same except that the first time it's in the future tense and the second time it's in the past tense. That's the only thing that's different. And they were like, this went on for so many chapters. And that's sometimes what John's telling of the gospel can feel like as well because it's set up so that you see um, Jesus do a thing and then he talks about the thing that he just did. So today we're going to talk about him doing the thing and then next Sunday, or only a few days from now, this coming Sunday, we're going to talk about him doing another thing and talking about it, but we're gonna skip the middle talking. So I hope that made sense. So I am reading from the Gospel according to John chapter five from the beginning. After this, meaning after he healed that um, official's son from earlier in the week. After this, there was a festival of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Beth Zatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, The man who made me well said, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, they started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason, they were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. Right, so as you can see, I have one million notes Uh, most of which didn't make it into the sermon on Sunday. So the first thing we need to say, and this is going to become more and more prominent the farther we get into John's gospel, is that when John uses the word that many of our translations just put the Jews, um, the word is ha yudoi. So it's like, it means the Judeans in many cases. Um, like people who live in Judea as opposed to in Galilee. In some cases, it means Jewish leaders, like the sort of religious authorities who also have a little in with the political authorities. Um, It pretty much never means what we would now mean by saying the Jews, because he does, John does not mean the entire Jewish people. Not least because, of course, Jesus is Jewish. His disciples are Jewish. Um, many of the other people who follow him, Jewish. Many of the people he heals, Jewish. So, like, everyone around in the story itself is a Jew. So when we say the Jews did this or they were persecuting him or whatever... Um, We cannot read that as being about the entire people because it's not true. We can read it as either people in a particular um, authority space, like people who have religious or political authority. Um, We could potentially read it as the elites of the Jerusalem society or a sort of generalized kind of slur about people in the southern part of the kingdom as opposed to in Galilee, um, though that's the least likely read of that. So anytime you hear that, sometimes I'll 
sort of correct it as we go and say the Jewish leaders or the Judeans or the Jerusalem elites to try to get a sense of who is in the story. But um, if you hear it just say the Jews, then you should know that it does not mean the entire Jewish people. It, John is using that term to speak about specific people who are opposing Jesus in one way or another, but they're both Jews in this situation. Um, and the people to whom John was writing are people who, remember, there's no temple anymore by this point. John was writing in the late first century, probably between 90 and 100 or so. And the temple was destroyed in 70 CE. Um, and so John's community are people who had primarily been Jewish, but they began to follow Jesus and continued to be Jewish, but then there was conflict about what it meant to be a Christ follower. And so those people either were put out of the synagogue, like there was a schism, or they chose to leave and form their own community separate. So um, even the people who would first have been reading this likely had Jewish background and may still be Jews in some cases, because um, that's typical of the time and place that we're talking about. So all of that said, Jesus went up to Jerusalem and, and he basically went, it seems, straight to this pool, which had five porticos or porches where people would lay. And then there was this belief that when the water in the pool was stirred up, it was being done, it was stirred up by like an angel or something. And the first person into the pool would get healed. And obviously, like you would have to wait and keep your eyes on the pool because you don't know when it's going to happen. And it might happen only once a day, once a week, once a month. And so you would just be watching and waiting for it to happen. And then you would have to be fast. But all the people lying there are ill. So um, you can imagine that it would be a race, but also sad and difficult to watch and also really demoralizing to be there waiting and never getting there first and to be there for 38 years I said on Sunday like that's a whole lifetime he may well have basically grown up there like maybe he was um injured or had a birth defect of some kind or was in some way disabled and his parents left him there or maybe it didn't happen until he was a little bit older, but in a place where there's not really any access to healthcare, like this is access to healthcare, and he has none. He has no means to access the healthcare that's available, um, which is not that different than a lot of situations people are in today. They have no means to access healthcare. That's not as much of a problem here in Scotland, but in other parts of the world, there are a lot of people who do not have the money or the support that they need to be able to get health care of any kind. And even here, if your first language is not English, for instance, or if you are um, a refugee or an asylum seeker, or if your body does not work easily and, and smoothly like a typical one, whatever typical means, um, then it can be really difficult to access healthcare. For people who are neurodivergent, it's even more difficult because you have to navigate so many different things and different pathways and understand what people are telling you in an unfamiliar and overstimulating environment. Um, so when you put all of that together, like even here where we have universal healthcare, there are people for whom the barriers are difficult to overcome. And when you've been ill a long time, even if you haven't been ill a long time, if you've been seriously ill, that's a really isolating experience. And then to have to try to navigate that alone and jump through all those hoops and over all those barriers, um, you can see why a situation like this would be particularly heartbreaking. Um, and also how the people involved in this story like don't seem to even notice. The man has just faded into the wallpaper, basically. 
so that by the time Jesus turns up and asks if he wants to be made well, and he gives a whole litany of excuses why he hasn't been, um, like his story is so overtaken by his illness that he can't imagine another one. But then when Jesus says, like, get up and walk, and he does, that seems to be, it's so understated to me. Like, Jesus said, take up, stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. And that was it. Like, that's all. No one else at the pool is, like, cheering or celebrating. They're not even calling out like you would expect if they saw this exchange that everyone would be clamoring for Jesus' attention for him to do it for them as well. Um, it's almost as if his illness and his, and his isolation has made him invisible. And isn't that exactly how it works? Even in a place with universal health care? We become invisible when we're ill or unable or unwilling to get the support that we need. So only at this point in the story do we discover that it's a Sabbath that Jesus has done this. John likes to tell the story this way where he gets it going and then like halfway through or like after all the action, he's like, oh, by the way, <laughs> it was the Sabbath. Um, that pattern is going to happen again in a couple of weeks time. So it says the Jews said to the man, so the Jewish leaders the, or the elites of the town said to the man who had been cured, it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. So here we're setting up what has happened and what people see. So they said to the man who had been cured, you're not supposed to be carrying your mat on the Sabbath. And he says, the man who made me well said to take it up and walk. And they asked him, who told you to take it up and walk? They didn't ask who made you well. Like they had no questions at all about his healing. Like even though that's how he started, he said, the guy who healed me after 38 years sitting right here while you did nothing to help or support me at all, he solved my problem like that and told me to take it up. And they're like, who told you to take it up? But he didn't even know who Jesus was. So it's clear that it is not because of his faith that he's been healed, it's because Jesus wanted to heal him. And generally in John's gospel, Jesus wants to heal people in order to reveal something about himself or about God, not in order to um, you know, show particular compassion. Like in other gospels, it will say that Jesus um, had compassion on someone or showed mercy to them, or it will say that he was like, that it was a gut-wrenching experience or that he was heartbroken or whatever. That's not what it says in John's gospel. John, Jesus in John is trying to reveal himself so that we will come to faith. So um, it, the guy never comes to faith in this story. We don't know obviously what happens after this part of the story. Like maybe he does come to faith later on, but in the telling of it, like the part of his story that we know, he doesn't. So it can't be about that exactly. Like that's not why he got a healing. Um, it's because Jesus wanted to. So they're all focused on the wrong thing. Twice already it's happened. He's been cured or healed. And they say, you're breaking this rule about carrying your private thing in a public place. And he doesn't know. So then Jesus found him in the temple, which is a place that he won't have been for at least 38 years, maybe even longer, because he wouldn't have been able to go there, first of all. Um, but even if he became unwell before the point when he was laying there, he wouldn't have been allowed in either. So the first place he went when he was made well was to worship. That was the first place. And Jesus found him there and said this very strange thing, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Now, like on the surface, what on earth would be worse than 38 years of sitting by this pool, like an entire lifetime or two? Um, but what has just happened that I think Jesus might be referring to is this man's sort of altercation with the 
authorities who said, you can't do that. So the bad thing that has happened to him is that these people have focused on the wrong thing and have attacked him for something that, first of all, he didn't actually have anything to do with, and second, was not the point. Like, it's a minor detail half a mile away from the point, and they've completely missed the point. But at that moment, he goes away and tells them who Jesus is. Now, another thing about John's gospel is that John uses the word sin in a different way than the other gospels do. He talks about sin as being about a sort of broken relationship with God. So when we're lacking in our relationship with God, that's what John considers to be a more sin experience as opposed to like doing a wrong thing. So carrying your mat on the Sabbath is not the sin in question here. Um, the sin in question here is being self-absorbed rather than God-absorbed. And the man obviously is still that. Um, perhaps that changes for him after this point, but in this moment, he's um, still not able to trust a relationship with God through Jesus. So the Jews start persecuting Jesus, the authorities, the Jewish authorities, started persecuting him because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. Notice they still do not think that the problem is the healing. They think the problem is the carrying of the mat. And so he should not have told the man to carry the mat. If he was going to heal him, he apparently should have just said, get up and walk, leave the mat on the floor so that you don't get into trouble. And um, Jesus' answer, my father is still working, so I am also working, is fascinating because the Sabbath commandment in um, one of the tellings, it's in twice in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, but one of the times it says, you know, God created in six days and on the seventh day rested. Um, and in the other telling, it says, you should rest because once you were slaves in Egypt and now you're free and free people rest, right? Enslaved people don't get to rest. They have to work nonstop, but um, free people have the privilege of resting and so therefore have the responsibility of resting. Um, but this idea that God is still working on the Sabbath probably would have been for some people a little bit strange and for other people there was already some thinking that like the first Sabbath God rested but after that like God was always at work even though um, creation obviously was still commanded to rest. So it's hard to tell exactly what people thought in that moment but for Jesus to say because God is working I'm working then does put him squarely in the arena of comparing himself favorably to God. Like they say the problem is making himself equal to God, but in some ways he's revealing himself to be God because it's only God who still works on the Sabbath and he's working. So um, that's a fascinating problem to be in. Now, I just want to come back and think about the fact that the people involved here never recognize what's actually happened. They're so focused on the small thing that they miss this giant thing that has happened. So they're like, who said take up your mat and walk? Why are you carrying that? And no matter how many times they hear that there's been a miraculous healing, they can't see it. And they, because they can't see that, they can't see anything, right? They are still caught up in the small stuff and in their sense of what's required when what has just happened is that Jesus has without any requirement done something amazing and changed someone's life. I don't know if um, any of you or any in this community have experienced that kind of miracle, but I would be willing to bet that we have all experienced times when we missed the big thing because we were really focused on 
something else, <laughs> the little thing or the wrong thing. Or we were looking like just slightly over there when we needed to look here. And so we missed it. And no matter how many times we heard, this is the thing, we still want this other thing. And so we keep pursuing it. Um, sometimes it might just be a red herring thing or it might be a conspiracy theory or it might just be like, I'm so focused on this idea that I can't entertain other ideas. I think that has probably happened to most of us. And um, I think there's a word here for us about that. That when we are so focused on the small things, or even the times, sometimes those small things feel big, right? We don't always know in the moment they are small things. When we're so focused on one thing, it's very easy to miss what God is doing elsewhere around us, even right in front of our faces. So I would like to suggest that we practice this weekend um, looking around, like broaden our vision, because we might just see Jesus doing something amazing right outside our frame of vision. So that's my challenge to us all for this weekend. So I hope that has given you some things to think about and pray about and wonder about and talk to God about. So let's take a moment to pray together, shall we? Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day that you have made. We give you thanks for being always at work around us and we pray that you would give us eyes and hearts ready to see Help us widen our frame of vision that we might recognize your presence and your work in our lives, even when it is not exactly as we anticipated or expected or prepared for. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, I hope you have a great weekend ahead. I know it's only Thursday, but um, Minister Weekend starts tomorrow, <laughs> so... Whatever you have planned for the next few days, may it be full of blessing for you and your community. And I will see you on Sunday. Until then, cheers and peace be with you.